when you when you first started doing the, the suspension performances, did you do private practice runs first, or no. did you literally just no. do it in the, in, the, in, the, in the gallery to start with? <coughs> um, look, I, I did a series of performances which led up to the suspensions, mm -hmm. which were sort of fairly fairly tough physical experiences mm -hmm. for me. So, for example, the performance I did before the very first suspension event was a performance where I stayed in a gallery for a week, I stitched my lips and eyelids shut with surgical needle and thread, and I had two hooks in, into, the, in, into my back uh, with cables to eye bolts in the wall. So I was sort of tethered to the wall of the gallery, and I stayed there for a week, you know, not, obviously not eating, not drinking, not speaking, not seeing. I could hear. And that, that that was that was it. What was the um, response of the art community to that? Well, I mean, this was in Japan, and uh, I guess probably only about 150 people visited the gallery during the week. I mean, it wasn't. Again, these these weren't sort of advertised widely because I was concerned the performance might be stopped. Um, I'd had trouble before in Japan. I had a suspension performance stopped before it happened. We were. We were stringing together. Uh, we were stringing um, a cable between two buildings, and the police caught us. And so we never. And, and even though we tried to kind of bluff our way around it by saying, "Well, we were just doing this installation, the sculpture, and so you know," but they they demanded that we take you know take the thing down. And, and so doing anything in Japan meant doing it either in a private gallery space or, or a remote location like the the seaside suspension where. Where you know there was, well, there was no audience except for four fishermen on that crop of rocks uh, nearby, and a few fishing boats that went past. So now you ran into some problems in New York City as well. With, uh, <coughs> yeah, New York was, um, you know, whereas in Copenhagen we we, we were able to get permission. Um, we you know we had to get like we used a huge crane, right? So. We had to convince the union uh, to allow two workers to operate the crane. We had to convince the director of the Royal Theatre, where construction work was being done on their roof and ceiling, uh, to allow the performance to happen. And then, and then we had to sort of get the police okay because it was like totally public. And actually, the police assisted in in in. Um, in Copenhagen, uh, the police, in fact, were there when we were pulling the body up, and, and they were actually controlling the traffic and keep, keeping people at a safe distance. And um, but New York, uh, yeah, we we were just told we wouldn't get permission, and, and and so we just went ahead anyway. And this was in East Village, in East 11th Street, and so what happened was that I was in the fourth floor room. And there was a small group of artists who were helping, and we did all the insertions in, in the back, into, into the back, and I think used 18 hooks in that performance. Um, when everything was ready, the, 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 the cables were connected to a kind of a pulley structure, kind of a flying fox arrangement. And we had, just before then, we had dropped the cable to the street below. We'd, we'd sort of bolted the, the cable to the wall and then dropped the cable down to the street. There was a guy down there waiting, picked the cable up, ran across the street, up the fire escape sort of <coughs> steps, and then, um, you know, we fixed the cable on the other side. And by this time, like, there were people in the apartments around sort of coming out, seeing what, what was going on. I think they imagined it was some kind of tight rope kind of, you know, thing happening. And um, and so when everything was ready, the body just kind of rolls out of the window and then stops uh, middle of the street. And because of course, even though you you tense the cable fairly strongly, it, you're still going to get a little bit of a, a little bit of give in the centre, and so the body sort of finished at that point. And and um, yeah. And, the police are I mean, we were hoping it was going to be at least a 30-minute performance. We didn't think it would go much longer than that. But the police arrived in about five minutes. I mean, they were, they were there really quickly. And we'd locked the downstairs doors. 
uh, but they broke into one and, and, then, and then kind of pulled me in so it only went for about 12 minutes it was uh, yeah, and, then, and then yeah you got arrested and, and, and had to go to court on the following Monday and <clears throat> like if you go to court in New York City Monday morning there's about 300 like people jam packed in there and, and there was a female judge and, and, and like I think the case before me was like some drug dealer, you know, peddling, you know, you know, crack or whatever, and 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 the case after me was a case where some guy had sort of shot his wife. So <coughs> I think the judge just thought this was sort of light relief, <coughs> and just sort of um, <coughs> yeah, just just sort of let me off really. I mean, just reprimanded me, and I mean, I was concerned because I I had presentations to do in Chicago and Seattle and I and I and also I didn't want my passport stamped with any any sort of you know uh, criminal charge of any sort so on, on, when you were doing the first suspensions how did you decide just from a purely technical point of view what kind of hooks you'd use how many you'd use how big they'd have to be how you'd rig it how did you come <coughs> to those, those solutions yeah well, you know, <clears throat> I really did not. I mean, I, I I'd never been to India. I I I never met a fakir. I wasn't part of the S and M community, and of course, body piercing or body modification shops weren't around then. <clears throat> and really, it was just um, it was just trial and error initially. But but there was no. I mean. The first time we did the suspension was the first time it happened for me. In other words, there was no no kinds of testing or, or no kinds of um, yeah. We just sort of did it. I mean, it was just like I looked at anatomy books and and sort of figured where would be the safe place to insert. I knew that um, I should primarily insert into skin rather than. <coughs> try to avoid muscle tissue because if you stick a hook in the muscle you'll bleed a lot you know muscle is highly oxygenated lots of blood capillaries in muscle so um, and then I you know yeah I figured out well each each point if I used 18 hooks you know each point would only have to support three four five kilograms of weight so I was pretty confident of it but um, the first person who did the insertions for me was a, a landscape gardener. And then in subsequent performances, because you know, they were in different places and in different countries too, um, yeah, they were just artist friends who agreed to, to help really. And it was, How did you actually cut the hooks in? Well, one, <coughs> one person was, would pinch the skin up okay. and hold it up and then the other person would would would, would insert the hook and now effectively yeah effectively they were sharp stainless steel sharp hooks and with the barb filed off and also the the front part of the um, the, the the hook faceted because <clears throat> the first the first few performances I did I just simply sharpened I filed the filed the barb off but just simply sharpen the point but it was still rounded you know it was still and, and of course it's very difficult to stick a rounded you know it's like sticking a pin through a bit of rubber right so then my, my landscape gardener friend who was a bit more practically minded he said he said what you need is a kind of like a, a cutting motion he said you should facet the <coughs> the, the hook and, and so I, 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 I just used the grinder and um, Put three facets <laughs> on the hook, and and yeah, that's how it was. That was the, the hooks that we used. And I used to get the, <clears throat> I used to get a set of new new hooks each time I did a performance, and <clears throat> I used to go go to the same Japanese fishing fishing store in in Tokyo, and I think well, they they did think I was some big game fisherman because. <clears throat> every time I'd come in, they'd sort of 
you know, they'd sort of like, no, I didn't speak Japanese at the time, and, and they'd go, ah, you know, <laughs> big fish. <laughs> So I, they just thought I was some big time fisherman, you know. <laughs> now, you, t- you first got the idea about actually, instead of suspending just with, with rope, but actually using the hooks after seeing Hindu suspensions. Now, I assume they'd be. Seeing, seeing Hindu piercings. Oh, and now yeah. I assume they'd be doing them in some sort of context of transcendence, but, yes. but you're doing it in a different context. What, what were you trying to achieve with, with those suspensions? Both for yourself and, and as, a, as a larger statement. Yeah. Well, the performances were. Yeah, they weren't done in, in in that kind of in that kind of ritualistic kind of religious situation. Um, this, there was certainly never any any anaesthetic used. Um, the body was never in a trance-like state. But there the were no time, techniques. You, you, said, you said that you had to. You said you had to abort the, abort the one suspension because that meditative state was sort of broken for you. Oh, I just. <clears throat> I was just joking, actually. Oh. <clears throat> no, it was kind of like with the rock suspension, which is a really beautiful performance, and, and I have to say it was. It was just. It was. I was extremely lucky. Um, we got it right, because in the f- first start. I, I, I wanted to make that that performance not a sort of a, a static and passive kind of a, a situation, but a more structural one where the rocks would counterbalance uh, the body's weight. So the ring of rocks. Would, but when I was finding like 18 rocks, of course I couldn't find them the same weight, right? So the rocks varied from about you know 3.3 to 4.3 kilos each. So, but then, I, but by that time, I'd done like six or seven or eight suspension performances, and I'd, I'd realised well, the skin in the back would stretch a bit more than the skin in my thigh, you know, um, and so I used the heavier rock, you know, connected to my thigh, my, uh, thigh, thigh area, and I used a slightly lighter rock with the, the skin of the back area, and so in that way, you know you had a kind of a, an equal kind of balance and an equal tension and I was sitting on the ground um, just cross-legged um, when the hooks were inserted both in the front and, and the back of my body we had already um, suspended the, the rocks uh, with slip knots from eye bolts in the ceiling and then when everything was ready the cables were connected to the, to the, to the hooks and then as I quickly um, released the slip knots and when enough rocks began to go down the body started to go up and it got to a point there where then I just jiggled my body around and I was only it wasn't a very high suspension ball it was about you know, couple, you know less than a couple of meters off the ground uh, jiggled my body around and and you know we were just I was r- roughly roughly evened out the level of the rocks and then to complete the performance, there were nine people invited, and they stood around the ring of rocks. They each took two rocks in, in their hand, lifted them up. <coughs> My body went down low enough, and then someone walked around and cut the cables, and it sort of gently fell to the to the floor. Um, that was really the most the most complicated performance, and the one that could have gone wrong. Uh, but didn't. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll re-ask them before I distract with you. Yeah. Um, uh, what, with the suspensions, what were you, what were you trying to say, and what were you, both on a larger level and sort of what were you looking for yourself when you were going into them, if anything? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I guess in the, in the, in those performances, the body is seen as a kind of you know sculptural object. You know, the skin is a kind of gravitational landscape. The stretched skin is is indicative of what it means to hang in a one g gravitational field, right? Um, so I saw this more as more of a kind of body installation, body sculpture, um, and, and and so you know, and so if you look at the performance, the images of the performances with the ring of rocks or the body suspended in in a tree or on an outcrop of rocks by the seaside or in an elevator shaft or 
you know, obviously there's a kind of a, a visual relationship of the body to the space or of the body to other bodies and, and uh, yeah, I kind of, I really thought of it in that kind of visual sculptural way um, and so, yeah, there was really no, um, yeah, no, no sense of, I mean, um, the, the way the performance happened was, um, you know, you'd be thinking about it for a few months um, then the day arrives when you're kind of building the installation or putting the eye bolts into the into the ceiling or, or whatever and and I normally was involved in preparing the installation myself with just a couple of friends helping and then when everything was ready the hooks were inserted the body was suspended and when it was all over you know you kind of patched yourself up you know and dab of alcohol a little band-aid um, and, and that was it. So there was no sort of, you know, my awareness was the same before, during and after. There was no kind of, um, yeah, no, no, no special... I think one of, the, one of the first times that probably most people outside of, outside of the art community came in contact with your work would have been probably in, in Apocalypse Culture. Um, in Apocalypse Culture, uh, Adam Parfrey's book. Oh, I, d I don't even know it. Oh, um, oh, oh wow, I uh, don't even know it. It's, you're, you're, um, you're juxtaposed with an interview with Fakir, where Fakir is saying, well, I, I don't think Stalak oh, ever, you know. I don't think Stalak ever really thought it because he wasn't able to nah. punch through that, you know, and get the bigger experience, uh, but the yeah, personal experience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, you, you were saying in the one suspension you actually... But, you know, I, it's really interesting because um, um, there was, you know, with the Obsolete Body book, that was published in 84, and uh, sort of maybe a year or two after that was published, um, uh, Fakir got in touch with me, sent me a letter, yeah. and, um, and so we communicated a little bit, and which was really neat. I mean, I was obviously interested in in um, in, in him as a person and, and what he'd done in in, in the S, for the S and M community in San Francisco, and and but but we never actually met. Until, until Lisbon, you know, about maybe six years ago, seven years ago, right? And um, and then that's when we did this joint interview, really, and it was a crack up because, of course, Fakir, you know, in a sense, positions himself or grounds, you know, his suspensions within this kind of, you know, transcendental discourse, this kind of spiritual, this sort of spiritual side to it, and. Um, it was it was really interesting. I mean, uh, but um, undeni you know undeniably th there there was a very different attitude, mm -hmm. and as I said, the performances were done with what I would term an acute indifference. You know, you do the performance with no expectation, um, being open to the possibility of what was to happen. Um, in a sense, that was the kind of um, the positioning that allowed me to, to do the suspensions because really these were done without no sort of uh, technical support or, or, or knowing what had gone on before in that traditional or being shown by, you know, being reassured by a teacher or a, or, or a fakir that this, you know, this is okay and you can do this and this is how it's done and so this was really for me anyway personally um, uh, something that uh, yeah I, I just wasn't sure yeah. was what was really happening at the time so. I, I find it interesting almost that, that you haven't almost like accidentally crossed that threshold you know with even with not just even with the suspensions but with the um, you know with the four four and a half hour long uh, uh, tens, tens performances um, these, 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 these very, very physically demanding It's ones. a kinetic muscle stimulator, actually. Tends is a little different. There's different kinds of stimulation yeah. systems. But, but um, uh, look, you know, I... I, I mean, to, to say that there, there are other sorts of experiences or to, or to imagine that one kind of experience somehow is... is qualitatively more meaningful than another. In other words, <laughs> if, if this body 
um, positions itself within a discourse of, of aesthetics rather than within a discourse of religion or within a, a discourse of, of, of pain and spirituality. Um, you know, I don't know whether you can argue qualitatively that, that one kind of suspension experience is, is better than another or more interesting than another or, you know, so, um, I mean, yeah, I would disagree with, with Fakir about that, but hey, you know, um, he's a nice guy. <laughs> now, you're, you're, am I remembering right that your suspension work ended in 1988, that was the last and suspension. What, what, what sort of took you to the end of that, that way of expressing um, well, I'd done the suspensions over a period of 13, 13 years, and you know, I'd, for me, what was interesting about this, you know, when I did when I did my first suspension, I never really imagined I'd be doing another one. It was kind of like, you know, this is it. I'm going to do a performance, a suspension, and that was it. But, but then, you know, it generated all sorts of possibilities. I kept thinking, oh, what about? being suspended upside down or what about the body as a as a suspended projectile or what about the body choreographing its movements with a large crane or so all of these possibilities came about and and and, and what about a very high suspension 60 meter Copenhagen one and and so I think just over the period of 13 years I kind of in my own uh, sort of artistic practice, I'd exhausted, you know, the possibilities or the possibilities uh, for this for this piece. And anyway, so and, and but but you have to remember that um, it wasn't that the physically difficult performances come first, and then the te technology oriented stuff comes second. These were happening simultaneously. Uh, I mean, the year that I was suspended by the seaside, I was also writing Evolution with my three hands. Um, uh, my third hand uh, project begins one year before the first suspension performance. I did the three films of the inside of my body uh, three years before the first suspension performance. I made helmets and goggles that split my binocular perception. Um, you know, in 69, 70, um, five or six years before the first suspension performance. Uh, but during the period that I was doing the suspension events, I was also performing with my third hand and um, doing the scanning and probing uh, using medical instruments, of, uh, you know, to my body as well. So it was not seen as a kind of, it's not this kind of... Um, a sort of modernist kind of um, you know accumulation or, or, or simple there was really an oscillation of concerns on the one hand exploring the physical and psychological limits of the body on the other hand constructing um, prosthetic augmentations when are you pers when with things like the third arm are those basically like really good versions of hammers like are they tools or are they something more? Well, the, the third hand, I mean, uh, I think most of the technology that's, that's been constructed, you know, for my performances is state-of-the-art stuff. I mean, when my third hand was completed in 1980, um, I mean, it was sophisticated enough that I got invitations to do presentations at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena and the Johnson Space Center in Houston to the Extravehicular Activity Group. Um, and I mean, I think the six legged walking robot, uh, the exoskeleton robot, is probably the largest six legged walking robot that holds a human body that's been constructed anywhere. Of course, that was constructed with the help of F 18 in, 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 in Hamburg. The new robot is probably the largest robot built uh, using uh, the rubber muscle technology. So uh, I'm interested not so much in the technology itself, but in making these prosthetic augmentations for performance. Um, yes, I, I want to make state-of-the-art stuff. I, I want to. 
I mean, what's interesting for me as an artist is to construct an interface to 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 attach it to my body, to directly experience it, and then that enables you to meaningfully articulate mm -hmm. about it. I mean, uh, so I'm not sort of so interested in in speculation and. and and you know, often people ask you, "Well, what are you going to do in ten years' time? Or what about what about growing this? Or or having a a brain implant? Or um, yeah, sure, but but I, you know, it's got to plausibly happen. I mean, and I mean, the extra ear project that we've been talking about um, that's a plausible surgical project. It was plausible in nineteen. 1997, when the when the project was first visualised, uh, but of course the difficulty was getting, um, you know, surgical assistance, mm -hmm. and which would have involved at that time microsurgery as well, and and uh, and and even though I got close with a couple of uh, medical practitioners, uh, especially one ear reconstructive surgeon, uh, it never happened, and and then last year. With Tissue Culture and Art Project, we took, I took a slightly different strategy and and experimented uh, with, with the idea of the ear being grown using living living tissue. Very similar to the ear on the rat's back. I guess, uh, in a kind of a similar sort of strategy, um, where we're using uh, a medical polymer as a scaffold. Uh, you seed that with living cells. As the cells grow over the polymer and into the polymer, the polymer is biodegradable, and you you end up you end up with a sort of a lump of living tissue in the shape of, in this case, an ear. Um, and if we were to construct it on my arm, uh, this would have to be inserted before it's fully grown to allow it to to, to develop vas vascular. Uh, to, be, to, to allow positive vascular authorization. Um, and, and, and then there would be sort of cosmetic surgery required to, to change that relief shape of an ear into a, a totally 3D ear. You'd have to cut the ear flap, lift it up, buttress it with more cartilage, um, a skin graft over that, and then finish it off by constructing the ear lobe with some skin uh, from from a, another part of your body, and and so the idea of a of a kind of a, a sculptural three dimensional ear on on the arm is is what's being attempted, and and the interest here is is in alternate anatomical architecture. So you replicate something, a, a, in this case a facial feature, you relocate it and reattach it elsewhere. Is there a longer term goal to have it be a functional relocation as well as an aesthetic one? Um, the ear was never, never, never conceived as an ear that hears, but there's a possibility uh, of the ear making sounds. So there were two, there were two sort of uh, possibilities here. One is that you implant a little sound chip and a proximity sensor. Uh, when it, anyone gets close to your ear, it would generate sounds from the ear. So the ear wouldn't hear, but it might be able to speak to the person who comes close to it. Or if you imagine having um, having the ear connected to a, a you know, little wearable computer. Um, with a, with, a, with, a, with a wireless system, then the ear could be a kind of internet antenna where you could tune in to real audio sounds uh, and these would be broadcast uh, to your other ears uh, to augment the, the other local sounds that you're listening to. So they're real possibilities, but initially um, it's it's sculpting the ear or growing the ear on the arm. It's uh, it's the most difficult part, really, and, and you'd have to do that and allow that to you know allow that to kind of um, uh, stabilise before you could sort of add any electronics. Yeah. It probably would be too difficult to do it all in one operation. Your your third your third arm obviously comes on and off. This will be your first. A permanent piece of art. Yeah, you know, I um, and, and in fact, that was say the difference. Often, 
often I've been on conferences or in, in publications with Orlan and um, as, as, as this kind of on the one hand they would say well Orlan does these very permanent things and on the other I got these prosthetic additions that I can put on and take off and and uh, I have to say that the third hand actually was designed originally as a semi-permanent attachment. The idea was that I was going to wear it as much as I would wear my clothing. Um, but what had, what had happened was that I, I had some bad skin irritation from the electrodes or from the electrode gel. And in the end, yeah, it really wasn't sort of very practical to to have it on all the time and also originally the, the, the hand was supposed to be constructed using carbon fibre um, and, and out of ceramics which would have made it even lighter. Uh, this was going to prove far too expensive and so in the end uh, I worked with aluminium, stainless steel and duralum and, and the advantage there was that I could cut smooth, you know, file and polish the parts myself, um, whereas the carbon fibre and ceramic stuff would have had to have been fabricated at the factory and, and you know, would have, that's one, another reason why it would have, would have cost too much. Um, so the, the, the ear would be, yeah, effectively the first permanent um, artwork on my body. And in a way, that's why I, I sort of admire um, a lot of the sort of body modification stuff that's uh, that's happening now. The the horns, the the, the staples, the studs, um, um, you know, stretching the earlobes and all that all that kind of body modification. I mean, of course, it can get much more extreme than that. We know, <laughs> but I, I love the aesthetics of the split tongue. Um, I mean, a split penis as much, you know, yeah, that's, that's tougher to, to sort of imagine getting something like that done, but um, uh, the Torture Garden, that first Torture Garden book was just a stunning publication, I thought. Will it, I mean, your, your suspensions and so on didn't really change who you, who, you, who you were and how you perceived the world, but as you start to do things that are actually changing your form on a, on a permanent level, do you think that it's going to change the way that you perceive yourself? Or? Oh, look, I think, I think those claims are, are, very, are very difficult to, to kind of both quantify and, and qualify. Um, I'm sure that everything that I've done has modified, and, and in fact... Um, you know, I mean, I cringe sometimes looking back at some of the things I wrote, you know, 30 years ago, and and uh, and of course, you know, that person thinks differently, and 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 I think perceives the world in in an altered way. But I, I guess I guess I don't sort of like making those claims because they're so they're so easy to make, you know. To make those kind of subjective claims, um, and so I've sort of shied away from that. I, I really don't, don't like to speak as a subject. Um, to me, the body is not uh, a site for the psyche or social inscription. Um, I don't see the body sim simply as a surface. Um, the body, to me, is not an object of desire. It's an object that can be possibly redesigned or modified or augmented and um, uh, and of course um, the premise of all of my work is that if you alter the architecture of the body including including its prosthetic augmentation then you you you, you are adjusting the body's awareness and experience of the world mm -hmm. so without wanting to you know qualify what I've done, I'm sure that, that the body is not the same body that's perceiving and operating in the world than it was 30 years ago. When you say the body, how much does that include the mind and who you sort of perceive yourself as a, as a person? Does it at all? or? Well, I, I think th there's, a, well, there's a real problem about talking in that way because 
it sort of reinforces a Cartesian split. You know, it's not. You know, it, if 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 you as the person opposite me, you know, speaks of having a mind and a body, well, you know, who is the the subject that's speaking? Uh, and in this case, it's just simply language that's speaking. Um, uh, you know, I, one can argue um, that you don't have a mind and a body in that separated sense that we conveniently talk about it. Um, and, and so when this person speaks about a body, this person means this physiological, uh, operational, aware and communicating body in the world. Uh, and that includes everything that goes up to making this behaviour, you know. Um, so, yeah, you're listening to a speaking body. Um, if you want to characterise it as a mind within a body, that's an arbitrary characterisation. That's a particular philosophical posture uh, which we identify as Cartesian or Platonic or, or Freudian or whatever. But uh, I think it's 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 difficult because language encourages you to speak as a subject and 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 encourages a categorization of the world uh, in order to clarify. Um, but in constructing categories, we then confuse um, these imaginings with with actualities. In in fairly simple terms, when people come and see your performances, what what do you want them to walk away with? Well, m most of the performances. Well, I would say that no performance is structured simply for an audience. Mm -hmm. um, and with the suspension performances, there were there were really, I mean, the audiences in New York and Copenhagen were audiences that um, I expected would would be there, but but um, these weren't only art audience, and I mean there were people off the street, people looking out of their apartment windows, um, um, so, and, and when people say see a performance with, with a walking robot, um, that's what happens, the robot walks, um, and there's a body that's connected to the kind of exoskeleton system that becomes part of composing the sounds and choreographing the movements. To what extent does the need uh, for funding affect your work? Uh, the need for funding? Um, well, I'll, I'll do just about anything to realise a project and, and sometimes that might mean collaborating with a university as part of a research project. Uh, that might mean sometimes making an application to an arts council to, to get funding that way. Uh, sometimes it's just getting the expertise and using the facilities of a company. Um, and when all of those things fail, spending my own money. Um, and that's how it's done. And, 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 um, and like I'm, I'm really low financially at the moment. Um, but that's because I'm, you know, I sponsored the Prosthetic Head Project on my own. And... Um, a year I haven't been paid for my work the last three or four months so <laughs> I'm still waiting for payment so um, yeah no but it is, it is it is always a problem but um, hey I, I just what, whatever works mm -hmm. yeah. now I'll ask I'll ask one or two other I'll, I'll jump back to suspension for a second the uh, the rock suspension mm -hmm. um, that's something that, that, that a lot of people inside the sort of modern primitive type suspension movement have emulated, but they've emulated it in a very different way. They've emulated it as a ritual to, 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 to take them whatever places internally. Um, 
what, what do you think when people take those performances and sort of transform them into something radically different than how you first presented them? Oh, and, and how you've become sort of a godfather to a movement <laughs> that, is, that is expressing very different <laughs> ideas but using the same tools? Yeah, but, but you know, of course, um, uh, you know, one, one can well argue that, that these kinds of um, actions, of course, existed with Hindu Indian rituals and and the Blackfeet Indians in the States, and but, but so... You, but you and Fakir are who people saw first, and who, who they who they looked up to, and who they, yeah. who they you know, who told them, you, you can do this, this will, this will work, and... Yes, yeah. Oh, I, I'm, I'm kind of easy about it all. I mean, I, I think, um, I think as an artist, um, uh, you're always open to interpretation, and, and also, uh, one would hope that uh, people might be inspired by what you do, but but they don't simply mimic what you do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, given that everyone has different agendas uh, in these performances, that's great. And and like one of the, there are several things that are, you know that have happened since I've stopped doing the suspension performances that I'm really pleased to see. Like for example. Um, you know, in the in the mid 1980s, I was trying to find six or seven people to do a group suspension. I thought it was going to be really beautiful if we could suspend six or seven people together simultaneously. And I I couldn't at that time. I I couldn't find. You know, I, I found one person who who, who we, we did a few. Um, insertions just to sort of I mean, test whether he really wanted to go ahead with it and, and didn't but but uh, but but since that time um, you know I people occasionally get in touch and say hey we've done this pyramid suspension we've done this group suspension we've done this um, swinging swinging suspension and 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 of course I wasn't even aware of the knee suspensions until Javier and, and Muffy were you know, told me about them in Copenhagen. So, and I mean, I'm sort of amazed with the with the knee suspensions. Um, so, and, and I was amazed with some of those some of those pyramid and, and other group suspensions. I think that's great.